the conference. So we are really excited to hear from Stephen and Taylor today. And I know they'll put on a great presentation. And they are ag teachers at Jinx. And so um, we have asked them to join us today to present a session for you. We're so excited that you guys are here and I'm going to let you guys get started. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's definitely a pleasure for us to uh, be able to do this. You know, we, uh, when we were approached originally um, by, by Emily to, to be a part of um, this, you know, we were really excited to be able to show, showcase not only our passion for, for agriculture, um, but hopefully be able to give um, all of you that are, that are tuning in today or maybe are watching this um, at a later date, for you to have the opportunity to see and hear from um, some school-based high school ag education teachers. And, and what we do is, uh, and as, as you know, um, with agriculture, is it's a very broad, um, broad area, very broad industry. Um, but we thought it was important to um, kind of get down to the foundation of things, get back to uh, something that um, I wouldn't say is, is necessarily um, something that we spend a ton of time on with our students, but we make sure and cover it every year so that they understand just how important this portion of the um, of the curriculum really is and, and why it affects everything else. But before we get any further, um, just take a moment to introduce ourselves and I'll, I'll start off. So my name is Stephen Tillinghast. Um, this is, I'll be going into my seventh year as an ag education teacher. And um, we this will be our fourth year here at Jinx. And so we're real fortunate and I'll, and Taylor will get to introduce herself here in a, in a moment, but we're real fortunate to be able to work together. Um, so a couple years ago, we had the opportunity to move to Jinx um, and be able to teach together. I'm originally from Owasso. And so uh, this is pretty close to home for me. Um, we were pregnant with our first, uh, I guess our only, our only child right now. Um, and, uh, and so that really allowed us to be able to um, work together, be closer to family and, and get to work in a school district that has really treated us exceptionally well. Um, and I'm Taylor Tillinghast, and I'm also going to my seventh year of teaching, fourth year here at Jinx. Um, and so for us being able to work together has been great. Um, and with that, we'll Yeah, well, get so we, uh, so what we, we, we sat down and we tried to think about what are, what's something that we could present about that maybe is relevant across um, all different disciplines, you know, certainly um, science-based, but, but something that we could really draw across um, just about any sort of STEM platform. And, uh, and we came up with this title of breathing soil into your classroom. And if you read our description uh, for this particular um, topic we're going to talk about, you know, as teachers, and certainly this year is, is no exception, um, it's going to be a, a little bit of a strange ride for many of us, um, especially, uh, you know, we teach in a 6A school system. And I know there's lots of decisions that are being made. Um, I know actually our, our district administrators are in a meeting right now making some final decisions before our school board meets next week regarding what school is going to look like. And, and so, you know, when we, as ag teachers, especially every year, we start trying to think of new and creative ways that we can encourage our students. And I'm sure many of you in your individual classrooms are doing the same. Um, you just don't want to get burned out. You don't want to, uh, I guess, get to a point where you're not excited about what it is that you're teaching. And so um, I know when I was uh, first getting involved in education, there was a, um, a little a, a more seasoned teacher. Um, I originally started at Chickasha in Southwest Oklahoma, um, who told me that it's, anytime that you're starting to feel like you're getting burned out, look for ways to breathe life into your classroom. And that really stuck with me. And so uh, we kind of ran with that a little bit. And so breathing soil, um, one thing that many of our students don't, uh, don't quite understand is that soil is a living organism, that it is, uh, it's not, well, dirt. I mean, I know that's kind of a, in agriculture, that's kind of a, a bad word to say all the time is, is dirt. Um, but with, with soil, it's truly living and breathing. And so we thought that'd be really important for us to spend some time talking about. Um, the next thing we have, and, and uh, Audrey will get this pulled up, is we got a quick poll for you guys. Um, we want to see a little bit if you, what you know about soil. Um, it's real short and simple. Um, but you see, should see it up there on the screen. Um, and if you can still see our video, it's going to be behind us as well. I know the white clashes just a little bit. But just real quickly, um, let's take a guess on uh, what your thoughts are on how long it takes for one inch of topsoil to form. Okay, we got 25 to 50 years, we got 100 to 200, 200 to 500, or more than 500. I'll give you guys just a few moments to, um, to select that. 
this is a, a question that for for us when we when we ask our students this type of a question uh, first first off it, it blows our mind that it takes longer than 25 years um, to be able to form um, the dirt as they call it outside um, and so it this is already blows their mind um, but uh, Take a moment to answer that question real quick. Um, let's see um, what kind of answers you come up with. And, and Audrey, whenever you're ready, we'll see what we what we have in terms of those results. It looks like we are um, mostly 29% with two of them, 25 to 50 and 100 to 200. And then we're tied for the, the other two, 200 to 500 and more than 500. So um, that's a that's a great question. And so we'll, we'll move forward. And, um, and so with that, this is one thing just to kind of set it all into perspective for you. Um, with all of those, there isn't necessarily a wrong answer. Um, the one that is probably least right is the 25 to 50 years. Um, but according to the NRCS, um, which, you know, that is an organization that um, is part of the USDA that deals very heavily with um, conservation and research when it comes to our natural resources. According to them, that the, the most general answer that is accepted is somewhere between 200 and 500 years for the vast majority of soils. Um, there are some type of soils, especially extremely dry soils, that can take longer than 500 years. But then there are other soils that are maybe a little bit more of a wet soil, um, have lots of organic matter in them that can actually form um, quicker than 200 years, um, closer to 100. And so there probably isn't necessarily a super right or perfect answer out of that. And we did that kind of on purpose. We wanted you guys to realize that soil is not the same across the country. Shoot, it's not the same across Oklahoma or for that matter, um, just around the Jinx area. And so there's lots of different, um, different things for us to discuss here. And so moving forward, this is something, and, and, and between Taylor and I, she's kind of given me the charge of talking about the first part. Um, I guess kind of the, um, she probably thinks is the more boring stuff, but I think it's important for us to talk about. Um, and so before I go any further, before I forget, this is really based around the, um, the Ag in the Classroom curriculum, playing in the dirt, discovering soil, okay? And that, so that is found in the grades nine through 12 portion of the lessons. Um, so that is where we're basing a lot of this off of. And, uh, and as teachers, we know that we modify our assignments all the time to fit um, the, our audience and what we're trying to ultimately achieve. And so the question that we often, um, that we often try to ask, and, um, and I know that I, I try to make this big enough to where we might be able to see a little bit of it between us. Um, I know there's a little bit of a weird glare coming from our, our ceiling in here, um, but what is soil? And that is a question that, that I pose um, to all of my classes. I specifically teach eighth graders, and then I also teach freshmen. And uh, I get really into soil with my freshmen. Um, we'll spend a couple weeks talking about this. And first off, when you say, what is soil? Um, you know, the first hand that usually goes up is, well, isn't that dirt, aren't they like the same thing? They're like synonyms for each other, right? And so that turns into a nice long discussion um, later on. Um, it's just interesting how many, how many students uh, don't realize that there is a difference um, and that there actually are some, some definitions and we won't get into those today, but that's just an interesting thing for, for you as a teacher to address um, right off the bat, you know, especially as like an interest approach. And, and that's what, how I do it is I really try to stir up some controversy right off the bat and, and see uh, what students know. Um, but just by the, the simplest of definitions, Soil is a naturally occurring mixture of both mineral and organic ingredients. And with that, it also has some type of a structure and a form. It's got some texture to it. And, and you think about that with your classroom a little bit. I think as teachers, we often try to create some type of structure. We try to create a form. We try to sometimes live within the boundaries of what we're trying to achieve. Um, but we like to spice things up a little bit. And you think about soil, it's really not that, that different. There are um, lots of different subsoils out there. Um, there's 12 main orders uh, of soil, and that's something we get into with some of our more advanced classes, and we're not necessarily going to do that today. Um, but there's lots of different types of soils that's out there, lots of different compositions. And so it's really important that, that students understand, um, just like our description for this, um, this little lesson goes with, that the soil is alive. It's something that is constantly changing and evolving, whether naturally or, unfortunately, there are some man-made man components as well, and we'll get into that just in a second. And that brings me to a quote. 
Um, so uh, I wasn't around when FDR was president. Um, I, I doubt many of us w were, but um, you know, during the uh, during the Great Depression and certainly during the Dust Bowl that we're going to talk about here in a second, one of his quotes that I think is really important. This comes straight from the Ag in the Classroom curriculum. So I, I can't say I've searched and found this on my own. And so the, the ladies and whoever else put this together, um, put this on the, on the lesson, the nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. And that couldn't be any, any further from the truth. Um, if we just sit down and simply think about the importance of soil in agriculture and then all of the different things that happen without agriculture, um, it could lead to some pretty slippery times, some, some very rough times. And that's kind of what happened. You know, we, we weren't necessarily as a nation doing everything we could to um, prevent um, the, this, what ultimately became the Great Depression. But it also originally kind of stemmed, stemmed to a certain degree from the Dust Bowl. Um, and so there was some, some, some climate-based events that were happening. Um, there, was a, there was obviously a tremendous amount of um, tillage of the soil that was happening and it was very unregulated. And so that, there was lots of pieces to it. You know, we certainly can't blame the whole thing on, on farmers and ranchers and agriculturists, um, but we certainly didn't help our cause when it came to the way we manage our soil. And, and, you know, when you go through Oklahoma now, you, you see lots of no-till farming that is happening. Um, you also see lots of windrows um, that are planted in terms of using trees to help block the wind from blowing any uncovered soil away. Um, because soil is a precious commodity, just like we talked about in that poll. It takes a long time to add just a couple, um, an inch, an inch and a half, two inches, whatever is necessary of topsoil. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. And so um, if you can tell by the picture behind us or if you see it on your screen, um, the, the red section is where the most severe erosion happened. And, and this is something that we talk about in our classrooms. Um, you know, I have lots of students or we all have lots of students that really dig history. We really love um, learning about the past. And, and I don't spend a lot of time on it because I, I know we're, we're trying to move forward and we're trying to be progressive and we, we certainly don't want to bore our students. But I think it's important for them to understand that that severe erosion did happen in especially the western portion of our um, of our state. And then all throughout the central portions of the United States, um, there was quite a bit of dust storm damage. And so over that 10 year period, um, that we really consider to be the, the Dust Bowl event, um, there was a large, large area that was in fact impacted. And, and so um, just moving forward, just showing you uh, a couple pictures real quick. And I think this is an interesting thing to think about. So that first picture on the left um, was a, a picture that I have seen, I think I've seen it in textbooks, I've seen it in, in a wide variety of areas. But that was actually taken in Southwest Kansas, um, you know, right in the kind of the heart of the, the red zone of that, that Dust Bowl where there was some severe damage. But I thought this was really interesting and I found this in a, um, on a website for a local newspaper in West Texas that the, the one on the right was taken last year in Lubbock. Um, very similar, I mean, other than the fact that one's black and white and one's in color, but those, those pictures look awfully similar. And you're thinking, wow, that's, or at least I was, you know, that's almost 75 years um, or actually it's more than that, it's almost 85 years um, in difference between those times. And you would surely think we'd have some progressive movements. Why is this happening again? And so there's, there's lots of important discussion that we can have with our students. One thing that I like to do just to talk about, you know, kind of our point behind this is to give you guys some ideas on things you can use in your classroom um, is that what we often will do is we'll do some debates with our classes and, and talking about um, not necessarily the Dust Bowl, but talking about just the importance of, of managing our resources and we'll put our students on, on teams against each other and it's almost like a courtroom type of a case where they have to argue for tillage or non-tillage. Um, they have to argue for pesticides or no pesticides. They have to argue for uh, you know, you know, horse drawn plows and using John Deere tractors. I mean, we'll do a wide variety of, of different things with the students and then ultimately it leads to some great discussion afterwards. Okay, um, and so the next couple things, and these are the areas that we really try to focus ourselves around a little bit, and um, we'll be talking about the, the soil textural triangle pretty heavily that's in the middle of your screen here in just a moment. Uh, Taylor is going to be doing a couple uh, hands-on demonstrations with you so you guys can actually see that in real life, but when, when it really gets down to it, we start off right off the bat 
way of talking about this whole idea of the circle of life, whether it be animals or we talk about plants, um, you know, the soil is involved right in it. You know, that is the, the producer agent when it comes to producing the grass that is consumed by, um, you know, consumed by the insects, consumed by the grazers who ultimately get targeted by, you know, the upper level in the food chain. And so we talk about the circle of life. Um, we talk about the soil horizons a little bit. Um, you know, it certainly is something that we, we, we get into when we're looking at the different types of soils. So more organic soils, that O horizon that you see on the right side of your screen for some soils, especially um, like my, my grandparents on my I guess my grandma on my dad's side of the family, her whole family grew up in Louisiana and known for very marshy areas, the bayou, all that stuff. Um, they have got some of the richest soil down there um, in terms of that organic layer. So that O horizon is massive for that soil. But then if you go to Death Valley, that O horizon is next to, it's obsolete, it's like not even there. And so it just depends on, on, on where you're at. And so we talk about these horizons and, and you got the topsoil and you got subsoil and you've got parent material and you've got the uh, you know the, the bedrock there's lots of things we'll get into with that uh, maybe not as much detail with our younger grades um, but it is still something we talk about but we are going to spend most of our time today really focused around the textural triangle and um, and so we're going to get ready to move on to um, talking about sand silt and clay which is a component of this textural triangle and, and for those of you that are our math teachers or you you integrate lots of math into what you're doing then this is a perfect way for you to be able to start working with percentages, doing some fractions. Um, you, there's lots of using rulers. There, there's all sorts of cool things, I think, that even a math teacher can really apply with, uh, with using the textual triangle. And, and I know, like as an example, you know, with all of us being educators, um, you know, we've got students who maybe struggle a little bit with some of their fine motor skills. You know, they might be on an IEP or on a 504 for something. Um, I have found that some of my students, this is even really good for them in terms of being able to follow a straight line or draw a line or, or count numbers or count lines. I mean, so there's lots of kind of unintended consequences that we might have that actually turn out to be a real positive thing for some of our students that maybe struggle just a little bit. But before um, she starts doing our next exercise, um, we, we kind of know a little bit about, about soil particles. Um, you know, many of us know that, you know, we have clay, um, which I completely forgot to change those, those top gills. I actually, for some reason, type clay, clay, clay three times. The top, one is, the top one is clay. That's a mistake on my part. And then you've got silt in the middle, and then you've got sand on the bottom. So I apologize there. But the, um, the clay is, you know, anything that's, that's considered two thousandth of a millimeter or smaller and then you have silt that is somewhere between that and five hundredths of a millimeter and then sand is basically anything between that and two millimeters all of that is still really small in the grand scheme of things um, but those are the main particles that we work with and, and certainly anything that's larger than two millimeters you know is it really what we would consider a foundational piece of soil particles um, instead, we, it's more like a gravel or a, or a stone, um, but when, when it really comes down to the what a soil is, that's uh, something we kind of exclude um, quite often, um, but it is still important to kind of reference that um, real quick. And then a loam, as you see in that picture, that's a combination of those three. Um, and so most soils out there are truly loam soils. There's not really a soil out there that is just a straight up clay soil. 100% um, clay, 100% sand, or 100% silt. Most everything is some type of a combination. And so I think that's an important thing as well. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Taylor. Um, she's going to do um, a soil ribboning um, exercise. But before she does, um, does that, I do want to hold this up real quick. And um, this is something that we do with, that we kind of use as a demonstration with our students. Um, we want them to be able to see and understand what what the real big difference is between these different particles. And so you've got something like, like sand as an example. Okay. I don't even know what this thing is like a, like a wiffle ball golf or ball. golf ball. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it, it's a really great example. Um, and then using something like this for silt and, and, wow. and, and getting them to realize that the difference between this plastic golf ball and this marble, there's still quite a bit of a difference there. And then we have these little plastic BBs that when you hold that up to sand, for clay, it's even smaller. I mean, it just barely fits inside my fingers. So there's a, we want the students to be able to see and feel and touch before they really start getting their hands dirty and seeing the difference. And when you have it all in, in a soil, 
um, there's lots of particle pieces in there. Um, we'll also do this um, with the students, kind of have fun. We'll give them smaller mason jars as an example, something that's clear that they can see. And that's actually um, part of what you guys may have been doing um, if we were doing this in person. Uh, was actually taking some type of food items and maybe giving them a percentage of sand, silt, and clay, and they have to use some math skill to be able to do some percentages and some equations and figure out how much of each food item goes into that mason jar. And so there's lots of cool things that you guys can do with that. I'm going to change and, um, and instead of sharing our, our video straight off of our, um, off of the computer, I am going to switch it over to our, okay, yep, it's going our, um, our little monitor thing here, our document camera. And then if there's any questions at all, you know, we certainly want to make sure we, we talk, we go through some questions. Um, if there's any that, that pop up, um, Audrey or Emily, um, any of those things that you guys see. Okay. So with the Agna Classroom Lesson Plan, um, activity two on it is soil ribboning. And this is a great way to get the kids um, to do a hands-on activity uh, we do it outside the classroom because it does get messy, but we will have kids bring soil samples from home. They'll bring just a uh, sandwich size Ziploc baggie of soil um, with the idea that all of their soil samples are different. Because um, if we just go around like our high school campus, it's more same, um, going to be the same. So what you do with this part of it um, is you just get, and I'm hoping everybody can see, um, just fill your palm, have your student fill your palm um, of your hand with a sample of soil. And then I usually have um, some sort of water bottle or something to pour, Stephen's opening it for me, um, just to pour a little bit um, and kind of mix it up. The procedures for this um, are obviously in the lesson plan but we also use um, a flow chart from USDA, um, for NRCS, excuse me. And so once you add the water, if it's too mushy, you can add more soil to it. You wanna make it more like a putty. That way when you do the soil ribboning, it doesn't fall apart. Um, like Steven said, the idea is hopefully it's not pure sand, um, cause with the flow chart, you can see if it's pure sand, it's gonna fall apart. Um, and so a little bit more. And so when you do the soil ribboning, um, there's a flow chart or the, the procedures for it. And then you just slowly start squeezing it. And the idea is to um, hopefully ribbon it enough before it falls off. Hope everybody can see that. Um, and from there, you can have your students figure out um, Obviously for this, it's not gonna be sand. So at this point, it's somewhat ribboned. Um, so it's probably not a loamy sand. And I know, I think, did we share? Yeah, the, okay. uh, like the flow chart. Yeah. yeah, so the, so while she's doing that, there, there is a, um, there's a flow chart that will be included in some Google Drive resources, I believe, um, that has uh, everything, but also um, Audrey can, and you, if you guys want to, you can take a picture of this if you want, you can, you can somehow, um, you, you at least see the, the flow of everything. You can, you can see that there's a step-by-step -step process and there's lots of these out there. And uh, there's also a really great video that UC Davis did um, that goes along with this. And so once you rib in the soil, um, if it doesn't break off, um, you keep going down. And then um, I just have my students, typically they um, will kind of wash their hands off. So it's not super, there we go. Um, and then they'll just take a piece of what they already had in their hand and then just smash it down because then they're going to see if they can find the grittiness of it. And then from there, they can just follow the chart or the steps to figure out um, what type of soil they have. So ideally, um, this is why we like to have the kids bring their own. Um, that way they can also kind of feel other soil samples. Instead of just feeling one, they're able to test out a couple. Um, and like I said, this is a great activity to do outside, especially um, if some of you guys are able to go back to school this next year 
it gets them outside, it gets them, you know, we can social distance outside with them, uh, but they get to do a hands-on activity and learn more about what type of soil they have at home or at school or wherever um, you get the soil sample from. Anything else on that? I think, I mean, it's, if you give them the chart um, and go through it step by step, it's really self-explanatory um, and the kids have a lot of fun with it. Um, and they just follow it and they're able to determine what types they have and everything like that. Okay. Yeah, it's, I know this is something I, I do and I know this is mainly a high school um, lesson that or high school session that we're talking through, but hey guys, this works great for just about any grade level. Um, sure. It's going to be a, um, it's, it's going to be a mess. It's going to be one of those that if, like if you're like me and probably like a lot of teachers, you know, extreme OCD mess is something that we don't necessarily always enjoy, um, but it's it's something that we can we can certainly make work. And so again, we'll have um, there are some really great flow charts that are out there, and I know we can't see this this perfectly, but my point is that there are some very visual flow charts out there if you if you do enjoy um, doing that. Uh, I know that's definitely Taylor. She is she is all um, much more of a, a flow chart, visual step type of a person. Um, for others, um, you can follow step by step. That's the great thing about the Ag in the Classroom curriculum. Um, you know, I know there's lots of, um, I know when, when I first started teaching, I'll be honest, um, that, and I'm sure the ladies have heard this before, um, that there's lots of people that just think about Ag in the Classroom curriculum as being for elementary kids. And that is, and I used to think that too, I'll be honest, I'll be the first one to admit that um, I didn't know if I could use this type of stuff with, with high school, but there has, they have done some tremendous work um, making sure that there are, there are lessons that are very, um, that can very easily be used with our high school students. Um, I have high school kids that struggle with this. Um, they, they struggle with, with, making, um, with making sure that they can do math correctly, that they can work with percentages that, um, you know, for some students, like I teach eighth graders a lot, and they cannot read a set of instructions to save their life. They cannot follow steps at times. Um, and, and I know many of you probably know, um, share that same pain, uh, whether it be with with, with with high schoolers, with middle schoolers, um, it can truly be um, a real mess. And so, um, you know, this is this is great curriculum that I, we really encourage you guys to use. Um, so they, I think it's really well put together. It's got some awesome activity sheets, and I know we're not necessarily referencing those today, but really encourage you guys to take a look at this one that is already put together for you. Um, there's some videos that go along with it. That video link that was on the uh, the the step by step deal from UC Davis. Um, that is probably to me um, that is one of the easiest ones to show your students, um, and that way they can actually see a video of somebody kneading um, the soil and ribboning it out and watching you know chunks of chunks of the soil fall off and understanding that there's a measurement scale to it all. And so that's a really a really cool video. There's a reason it's got like I don't know a couple hundred thousand views on uh, on YouTube. Okay. Um, the next one that we are going to uh, jump over to, um, and it's, it's, it talks a little bit more about using the, a jar to be able to de determine soil texture. So still thinking about that triangle a little bit, um, but when we're talking about um, soil texture, um, there's lots of different ways that, that, we, can, that we can try to determine um, some soil texture and, and have fun in your classroom as well. That, that's the real important thing, you know, making a mess with soil, getting water everywhere. That, that's fun. That's great. But, you know, like for me as an example, my classroom over at the middle school is, um, is carpet. I, I promise you I'm not going to be doing um, any sort of soil ribboning, probably in a carpet classroom. Um, and so I'm thankful that I have a shop at the middle school that I'm able to do this in. But I know some of you may be in a similar situation. You don't necessarily have a lab area you can use. Um, you don't necessarily have somewhere where students can squirt each other with water and, and make a mess, muddy mess, kind of like Taylor just did. Um, but this is something that is pretty easy to contain. And so um, Audrey has got the, has got the, um, the steps pulled up with uh, with this jar um, this jar test so just kind of run through them real quick we are going to use our document camera one more time um, just so you guys can see it a little bit more um, but i want to run through this first um, so the there is a little bit of, of, of fluidness when it comes to how you want to do this you don't necessarily have to use a big massive jar like this um, you can use something that's a little bit different and so um, what we did 
was we have a jar that we used and I know again can't see it perfectly um, but what you do is um, on this jar um, you will fill it about two-thirds of the way with water um, you're going to add the soil sample to it essentially about um, about one-third full with soil and of course there's going to be some dissolving action that's going to happen and then you add any some additional water if need be to where there's about five centimeters left at the top and then you know in terms of using the metric system which that blows students mind as well that's an important thing to keep in mind you know five centimeters that's about two inches roughly or so okay um, and then shake it up which obviously students love to to do anything that involves potentially making a mess obviously the lid needs to be on and you're going to let it settle for 24 to 48 hours um, the one that we have um, it's been settling for eh, about 28 29 hours um, we did it yesterday around noon um, and so it's been settling for a little while. The, the analysis part, I think, is where the real learning piece comes. And so uh, you'll notice that after it's settled, um, you're going to go through and use a ruler um, and then also use a Sharpie. Um, I used actually an Expo marker. That way we can reuse these jars. So, you know, Expo marker comes off real easy. It's actually already started to come off on the side, I think, from us touching it. Um, but in uh, you know the hard thing the kind of the hard part of this demonstration for us is that here in Jinx um, we are right up against the Arkansas River and so uh, consequently we have a ton of sand in our soil um, that, that's an that's an important thing to keep in mind this would be another one where um, we've had kids bring in soil samples from their house grandparents house wherever um, to try and get some different measurements that way they're not all the same um, and the kids can see more of those different soil samples. Yep. So the um, we have a lot of sand in ours. So the so the based off of the, the weight of everything, we know that sand um, really, if there is any gravel, which you're probably not going to have any gravel on a soil sample if you do it, if you do it correct for this activity. Sand is going to be at the bottom. Silt's going to be on top of it, and then your clay material will be on the very top level of that. And then you'll have some excess water. And if you don't have you know, excess water at in water and you can't really see through it all the way, that probably means you haven't given it enough time to let it settle. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind. So using a ruler of some sort, you want to make sure, um, really try to get your kids to use the metric system. That's a, that's an important, uh, important thing as well. Um, it really just, it really cha challenges them. It changes things up. It, I mean, in fact, it, it really, huh, it really kind of messes with them to a certain degree. So we use the metric system when we're doing something like this, we'll use centimeters um and do what they're gonna mark they're yeah gonna find their soil so you'll you'll find your different soil lines and and i went through and i know it's hard to see um but i found basically where i where i believe the sand line to be and you'll usually see a texture change you'll also see a color change um the other line is starting to come off a little bit um and so that is um that's an important thing there to make sure you kind of mark your lines good but essentially what you're going to do is you're going to measure each of those different sections and then really if you add them all together you've got your total your total height um, and so so for example just kind of as a using this as a range um, basically our our clay line it's, it's almost non-existent it's, it's pretty much close to zero um, so like our full height as an example looks like we're at about seven centimeters and then if we measure each of these individual sections we've got about um, a centimeter uh, or yes, yeah, but be a centimeter that makes up our silt section and then mm, about half a centimeter that makes up our clay and then the bottom portion um, which would be that remaining section down here that is all going to be our sand and we're certainly not going to run through necessarily doing the the exact math today um, but moving to the the next slide um, Audrey if you want to go ahead and, and bump us over to that one you can take your um, you can take your measurements and you can uh, and you can type those in or have them fill it in. You can do this on a Google Doc. You could do this in a wide variety of other areas. And so um, and so you the good thing is that really if you get kids to bring in some different soils, um, that is something that really um, that really helps the cause. It, it really makes it interesting when you when you've got a wide variety. Of different soils um, and so that makes things um, just fun for really great discussion and so um, for our example let's just say we're soil a is what we're working with so the the all soil particles that that depth in centimeters um, we said was seven centimeters our sand particle depth which is the next box down um, was 5.5 still was one 
centimeter and then our um, our clay section was half of a centimeter and was by doing doing the, the math um, which is the next the next thing that they have plugged in here um, going over to the next slide Audrey is um, is they've on the Ag in the Classroom curriculum they've got it laid out perfectly to where um, if you want to start figuring out what your sand portion is, here's the formula for, for your students that maybe need to use it. Total height of sand particles, which is 5.5 centimeters. The total height of all soil particles, when you add those together, you come up with, um, you come up with seven. And so you end up with 5.5 divided by seven. And I know, um, you know, I know there's probably some math teachers that are cringing at the ag, ag teacher math here that's going on, but that's okay. Um, so you have that total, you multiply it by 100, and we come up with a percentage of 78.57%. And then you go through and do your silt, and you do your clay, and uh, you ultimately come up um, with hopefully a fairly decent guess on, on what your soil is. And, and I know as an ag teacher, when I first started doing this, I kind of freaked out a little bit when you have soil samples that look like ours. Um, where there is a ton of sand and the other sections are so small and students kind of freak out you know I think students when it comes to science that's one thing that I think is kind of interesting is is that students will lose their minds sometimes if there are not like astronomical differences when it comes to um, doing experiments um, they don't realize that sometimes it's just the slightest of differences um, when you're doing an experiment that truly can um, still have some very reliable results. And so, um, you know, I think that's a real, a really important thing to keep in, keep in mind um, when you're teaching your students that you may not see an astronomical difference. Um, so like for our example, um, we know that we've got, uh, what do we say, our soil was, just to do the math real quick, I've already, already hey, closed my Steven, phone. So we have seven. Do you want to change your camera back where we can see you and not your table? Oh, hey, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> Thank you. Does that work, does that work better? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thanks. Oh, perfect. Yeah, we, we, we always forget we've got that thing plugged in. Um, so we've got so we've got 70. We'll just go ahead and kind of do some rounding and make it easy. So we have 79% um, when it comes to our, our sand um, with our silt um, doing, doing the exact same thing. We're going to do one divided by seven um, and we're going to end up with 14%. Uh, percent. And then with our clay, um, we're going to end up with looks like about seven percent. I know with doing some rounding, it doesn't quite come to a hundred. Um, does it? Yep. Oh, it does. Perfect. Okay, good. Um, so then, when you look at your soil texture chart that is at the bottom of this screen, um, you can um, take that and go, well, what is it? So um, by best guess. Um, we've got a very, very large clay um, sample of soil, okay? I mean, we're 79% clay. That's even off the chart, um, the, the more summarized chart that's on, on the bottom left corner. If you really want to get specific and you really want to try to dive down to where students have to um, kind of cross all the lines and come up with their section, then, then definitely doing um, the soil textural triangle is the, is the way to go, okay? Um, so that, that wraps up the vast majority of the PowerPoint um, and then we can just kind of sit here and talk and answer any questions. This is a great um, helpful links um, section um, for you to, to look at. So you have the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, that is um, if you want a true um, government funded, probably the most reliable out of anything type of a resource, that's a great place to go. And of course they're going to be um, very technical minded, um, especially if you have those students that, that love the technical side of things. If you're teaching an AP class, as an example, like an AP biology, AP chemistry, they're going to have some really great stuff there. Um, but they're not only going to have stuff for soil, they're going to have stuff for wildlife. And, the, and if you do a wildlife lesson, that ties right back into soil. Um, you know, there's lots of great things there. Soil Science Society of America, they've got a website called soilsforteachers.org. They've also got their kind of parent website and it's soils.org, so, so pretty, pretty basic there. Um, but they've got some great resources. Uh, I think you can actually order some different kits and things off of their website. And then Science Daily, that one, was, it's my, that one may seem kind of weird, like why I put that one on there. But Science, Science Daily, I was doing some reading about them, and I see articles from them every once in a while. They're basically an aggregate um, website that pulls in lots of different articles. Um, but the cool thing is they're not searching like, um, like CNN or Fox News or 
um, or, or some blog website. They're, they're pulling things from reputable, educational, scholarly articles and, and, and companies and organizations and things like that and bringing those all in to where you can find some really cool science articles. So sciencedaily.com is something that um, I don't necessarily get on it a ton, but every once in a while um, we'll spend a little bit of time there. And, and, and guys, that's about all that we, um, we have for you. Um, I know we've got um, about uh, five to seven minutes left and we certainly um, wanna answer any questions um, that maybe are out there. Um, but please also note our, um, please, please note that we have our, our contact information. It's basically our first name dot last name at jinxps.org. Please feel free to reach out to us if you guys have um, any other things um, that you'd like to ask us. Stephen and Taylor, thank you both so much. Lots of good comments coming in. Everyone's enjoying this session. Does anyone have any questions for them before we wrap up? Um, do you guys have any other um, pointers or tips for them for including agriculture or working with their ag teacher uh, maybe doing um, partnerships of, between classes and anything like that, Stephen and Taylor, that you'd like to share? I know with, I know certainly with, with what I have found is really cool and important is if you start as an ag teacher, I try to make you know, connections with our science teachers, especially, I mean, not hating on the other, the other departments and whatnot, but we really, we try to work really closely with our science teachers. We're really fortunate here at the high school um, to basically be right across the hall from several of our science teachers. Um, we, for example, we have a an AP environment is it AP environmental science that's right across the hall. So we have a yeah AP environmental science teacher across the hall, and he actually does a lot of burn plot stuff um, and a lot of soil science stuff out at our burn plot facility um, that the school owns. And we've actually worked with him um, on a couple of science fair projects for the ag side of things um, through FFA. But he's helped a lot with that um, on the soil side of things. And if you can just make those connections with your your science teachers, um, a lot of, at least for us, a lot of ours love to, to help us. They have different ideas, different resources that we can try. Um, and with us being right across the hall from them, it's, it's great because we can just step out in the hall and talk with them. Yeah, the, I know one thing that we've, as, and I know many of you guys probably teach in schools that do have an agricultural education program. I know we're, um, ag ed, thankfully, and you know, certainly kind of selfishly, we're, we're glad to see it in pretty much every district um, for the most part across the state. And so uh, one thing that we always strive to do, and again, I know this is more of a high school session, but we really try to start at the younger, the younger grade levels with getting them to understand the importance of not only agriculture, um, but understanding soil, understanding that soil and dirt are two different things and, and understanding that, you know, the, the more often you can use the word soil, the better. Um, and so that's a real, um, a real cool thing um, that's important for us to, to do as well. So making those connections and, and, and getting students, getting something hands on. And I think that's the, the best thing that we can do, whether it be an extracurricular um, or um, a, a core class, whatever it is, um, just hands on activities. And um, we know soil isn't necessarily the most exciting thing in the world. Um, but we wanted the big thing we want to share with you guys today is, is not necessarily the, the chemistry side of it and how can we make chemistry of soil fun. Uh, I think that there's some really cool lessons that we could do there as well. But it's just that simple hands on activity that students are going to love and going to remember, um, hopefully the rest of the year. For you, it may have been the worst pain in the world in terms of them making a mess. But but hey, they got to have fun and they got to truly see um, how different soil is from one place to another. I was going to agree. They, uh, you said soil might not be the most exciting, but I'm pretty sure my boys would rather uh, do your experiment and your hands-on activities than, than work shades any day. So I think you made it very exciting. Um, someone saying I need to have my agronomy slash soil science husband visit class. That's a good idea too. Hey, that's one thing that we, we love is, is anytime we can bring in experts mm -hmm. that, that know way more than we do about a subject, we may, we may know enough just to be dangerous, um, but with uh, anytime you can have an expert come in that, that can make it fun for the students too and not bore them with the, the technical side of things, um, I mean, those are, those are all great things. And I know this year may be a little bit different. We may not be able to have guests come into class, but, but hey, guys, don't forget about if you are teaching something in a virtual platform, they can still be a part of those experiences as well. I mean, obviously we got to follow um, kind of our 
different school rules as far as privacy and all that great wonderful stuff. Um, but if it's allowed by your district, um, there's you can have those virtual video teleconferencing type things or have have a guest create a video demonstrating things. There's just all sorts of things you guys can do. Um, so definitely don't get stuck in that rut of not being able to breathe soil into uh, into your classroom. That's a great reminder. Thank you. And I want to share too, there's a um, Journey 2050 uh, webinar that's going to be happening August 13th. And we shared the information out on our Facebook page. If you guys are interested, we've had a few people um, share about Journey 2050. It's for middle school and high school teachers. So every, or um, students. So everyone that's on here, if you're not familiar with that Journey 2050, that webinar might be something that you want to participate in. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity um, if we did have to go to distance learning or if you're starting out in distance learning or um, for you guys as ag teachers, if you are fortunate enough to get to be gone to stock shows and have a substitute, Journey 2050 is, is a great uh, resource for you. So everyone, you can get our Facebook page and find out more information about that. Stephen and Taylor, you guys did a fantastic job. I'm so glad that you joined us today. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. you. And Melody and Emily, do you guys want to come on and sign off? This is our last session of the two-week two week summer conference. It's the easiest way to do summer conference. I've actually worn shorts and got up late and all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> well, thank you to everyone that joined us. It's been an awesome five days. It's really been fun. It has been fun. It's uh, been good to see familiar names on the chat and then also to see some new names that I don't know. So maybe we'll be making some new friends. And so we're excited for all of you to have joined us. And thank you, uh, Stephen and Taylor, you guys did a fabulous job. And you're the perfect way to wrap up our conference. Thank you. Side note, um, Emily, this is from when I student taught with you. Same jar, same everything. I love it. <laughs> it's traveled to the multiple schools. Yes, Taylor's so student taught underneath me. So anyway, it's kind of fun. And I left Jinx and they kind of came. So yep. perfect. We're here. Yeah. <laughs> <Love it. laughs>